All right, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Herald Inside LI. I'm your host, Sky. Herald's community newspapers and Richner Live events launched our weekly webinar series with me as the host in August. And together we've produced an episode each week featuring dozens of community leaders, organizations and elected officials to share stories about their industries. Real local, real news. That's the slogan for Herald Community Newspapers and for this show. It's now December. That means we're in month nine of the pandemic. That means anyone who was pregnant in March had their baby already. That's how long it's been, a lifetime. Family lives have changed, all of our lives have changed. It's clear that this period of time is no longer temporary. It's our new way of life. And part of embracing this new normal involves embracing 5G. How, you ask? Well, technology is playing a larger role in our lives than ever before. Think about it. Right now we're hosting a virtual event. Anyone watching is either on Wi-Fi or LTE. Do you remember the days when you couldn't get internet unless you were on Wi-Fi? Through technological advancements, we're able to be connected anytime, anywhere. The internet has brought us closer. Over the last nine months, we've shared holidays, birthdays, and weddings with friends and family across the world, virtually online. We work from home. Kids go to school from home. We have telemedicine appointments with doctors on our computers. People explore real estate via a FaceTime phone call. Our cars are built with maps that receive updated traffic data every four minutes. All of this involves connectivity and data, and as we continue to advance ourselves, we'll need 5G. Today, I'm joined by four people who understand the ins and outs of 5G and data and how it will affect our region. I'm here to ask your questions and moderate this discussion. For anyone watching, you're welcome to use the Q&A feature on the bottom of the screen to submit additional questions, and I'll try to get to them all. This webinar on the power of 5G is a two-part series. So if you like what you see today, please sign up to join us again next Thursday, December 10th at 10 a.m. where I'll speak with more local leaders and dive even deeper into the world of 5G. And if you, you'd like to share today's webinar with colleagues, friends, family, or neighbors, it's being recorded and you'll be able to access that recording today on our website which is www.liherald.com slash inside li. That's liherald.com slash inside li. For today's panel on the power of 5G, I have with me Caitlin Bruckner, spokesperson for the New Yorkers for 5G Coalition, which aims to educate people about the capabilities of 5G and the infrastructure it requires. Matt Cohen, vice president of government affairs for the Long Island Association, which represents hundreds of Long Island businesses and organizations. Jim Misevich, Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Photon Sciences at Brookhaven National Laboratory, home to the world's only electron ion collider and many more high-tech cutting edge advancements. And Carmen Rajamani, Director of the East Area at Crown Castle, the nation's largest provider of communications infrastructure. I thank our panelists for taking the time to join me and our audience who is watching and our sponsors, New Yorkers for 5G and Crown Castle. Panelists, now that we're all here together, I'd like to do something I do each week, which is take a screenshot of us that will be used for next week's edition of Herald Community Newspaper. So if you want to smile and wave, I'll do this. Great. Thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get to it. And panelists, please know this discussion is meant to be conversational. So feel free to respond to what one another are saying. Let's start with Carmen Rajamani of Crown Castle, the company that re that's responsible for implementing the network of communications infrastructure, towers, small cells, and fiber, which is part of 5G. Carmen, you spend your days explaining 5G to communities. And while we've heard that 5G is the next generation of connectivity, what does that mean and why do we need it? So 
what a great question and what a great topic. And thank you so much for thinking of including me in the panel. Um, I'm really looking forward to the hour that we'll spend together. Um, that in short, 5G, so what does that mean? Um, it is, uh, the definition is five, uh, the fifth generation mobile network. So unbeknownst to all of us, we've been going through one through four. And in uh, the United States, we are currently in the fourth generation, where essentially it means that mobile technology really became mobile. You didn't have to have one of those brick phones and where you have your phone, it works, if not all or most of the time outside and just continuously. In prior generations, you may have to be inside or next to some piece of equipment um, or it only worked inside of a building and didn't work outside. And so now we are currently in the fourth generation. It works, the mobile technology works mostly everywhere. Fifth generation is really amping that up. And if anything, we're thinking that it is going to be so transformative that it is like, um, when the automobile or electricity was created. And I know that seems like, wow, that's a, that's a big um, challenge. And so what does that really mean? And so with 5G, it's a platform for innovations. It's the next technology that's going to allow all of these things that we keep hearing about, autonomous vehicles, um, where doctors might be able to perform surgeries remotely um, by looking at their computer and they can direct a doctor to make certain movements those sorts of things will come into being. And so with that, you need uh, some um, new infrastructure or the infrastructure that we have to be added onto um, and to make this happen. And so you think, boy, that sounds great, but why do I need it? I might want it. And frankly, my children do because right there, they have 10 wireless devices and they want to look at, you know, game and talk to their friends constantly, but it has real world implications, which now I think we can see so much more clearly now that frankly, we're all in this pandemic and lots of us are stuck at home. The technology allows us to continue to work from home. My husband and I are fortunate enough to do that. Um, that it allows our children to be able to have continue their educations. It's those, and we, we, I have four small children. One of them we thought broke her finger well, um, a couple of months ago. It allowed us to hook into a, an emergency room doctor without having to go to the doctor and get a diagnosis. So it is, it's for fun things that you hear about virtual reality. Um, but how Carmen, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but of course, I want you to speak louder. Please. Oh, sorry. I, yes. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> sorry. Um, but it has real world um, implications um, that we were coming to expect, frankly, in the future. Okay. Real, exactly. It's all about our future. And I know that Caitlin is a spokesperson for New Yorkers for 5G, of which Crown Castle is a member. So, Caitlin, could you tell us about all these things that Carmen's talking about, the infrastructure and everything involved, and why there is a coalition to advocate for 5G? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Sky. And um, just to dig a little bit deeper into what Carmen was saying, it's really interesting. As a result of the pandemic, the nation really for the very first time is collectively understanding that online access, it's not a privilege, but it's a right. Connectivity has truly become essential and really key to success, as Carmen mentioned, in our increasingly digital world. But unfortunately, it's out of reach for millions of Americans, including many here in Long Island. And many of these people lack access to high-speed internet. And this hurts their ability to participate in remote learning, access their telehealth appointment um, to check out a finger, um, or to work or even just socialize from the safety of their homes. So as we really look to the future and collectively work to make sure that America can remain competitive but also connected in the coming years, it's really crucial that today's investments not only achieve the goal of universal service, but also really lay the foundation for even greater advances tomorrow. And that's what we're here to talk about. That's 5G and that's the next generation of wireless technology. But unfortunately, the promises of 5G really can't be realized unless the state and its local government partners work to encourage and not disincentivize the industry from deploying the technology that's really needed and necessary to making this a reality. 
So to answer your question, that's really why the coalition New Yorkers for 5G was formed earlier this year. It's to continue educating these key decision makers, businesses, and just residents at large about the importance of increasing next generation connectivity and to really advocate for policies that will bring 5G to every New Yorker, especially here in New York. And the coalition formed around the same time as the pandemic began, which proved to be an even more important time for us to need 5G. Exactly, and I will say the success of the coalition is really exemplified in the vast array of coalition members and the diverse coalition members that we have. I mean, for example, here on this call, we have the Long Island Association, Crown Castle. We have a huge assortment that spans various different industries. It really shows how important 5G, 5G is, and it touches, touches everything. Exactly. And you mentioned businesses, and the Long Island Association is a member of New Yorkers for 5G as well. And, and Matt's here, and he interacts with the business community through the Long Island Association. How does 5G impact businesses and, and what do you see as its impact on the future of business on Long Island, Matt? Hey, Sky, I want to just thank you and uh, your great uh, publisher, uh, great friend. He's on the LA Board of Directors as well, Stu Richner. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I'm looking forward to being part of this panel with Caitlin. As uh, she mentioned, we're part of the coalition. Uh, we work closely with Carmen and the folks at Crown Castle. And uh, while I don't know Jim personally, we've uh, Brookhaven National Lab and, and the LA are very close partners, we work very closely with Dune Gibbs. Uh, who runs the lab and David Manning. So looking forward to being a part of this panel. We look at this as a economic development issue. Um, I actually just recently came across a study by PwC, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, you know, very reputable, reputable firm that their report, very comprehensive report found that with 5G, the implementation of 5G by 2035, the global economic value would be $13.2 trillion, 13.2 trillion with a T globally and that it would create 22.3 million jobs in the 5G global supply chain alone. Those are real numbers. And then if you look locally, you know there have been studies that have shown in the townships of Henstead, Brookhaven, Islip, Oyster Bay, real GDP growth, real jobs. We're talking about $1.1 billion in GDP in Hempstead, estimated 7,100 new jobs, $735 million in GP, GDP in Brookhaven, 4,500 new jobs, $504 million in GDP, and 3,000 jobs in Islip, and in Oyster Bay, 454 million in GDP and 2,700 new jobs. That's a real economic boost. And that's what we need right now more than ever. You know, as we're struggling to recover from the devastating impacts of COVID, obviously from a health perspective, we're, all, we're obviously also <clears throat> got to do what we can to um, recover from economic perspective. And 5G is part of the way out of that, um, out of the darkness of the tunnel into the light, right? It's a way to create new jobs. It's a way to go to the future. Um, and in terms of the business community, you know, the optimization of service delivery, when, whether it's transportation sector, logistics, right, supply chain, the energy grid, water management, right? These are all schools, education, uh, healthcare. I mean, healthcare, you, you folks have already mentioned a few times, this can tran uh, transform healthcare in a time when we need to be transforming healthcare anyway because of what's happening with the pandemic. So um, to the LIA, which obviously is very supportive of economic development opportunities, we should be taking the challenges that we've seen now with COVID, realize there are economic development opportunities out there and 5G is certainly one of them. And now transferring over to the scientific community also, which you hit on, we talked about health and business and all the different ways that 5G impacts all these different sectors. Jim, over at Brookhaven National Lab, you're working on a bunch of scientific advancements that now a lot of the researchers have gone remote. So how will 5G impact your research that's done at the National Laboratory? Thanks, thanks very much, Sky. And also let me thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, really delighted to participate in this. And uh, uh, we are a part of the Long Island community, as Matt mentioned, we're, uh, we're part of the Long Island Association and we're, we're, we're really connected with, uh, with Long Island. And, um, but, but a really important part about networking and 5G, it's, it's kind of important for our future. And if I may, I'd like to share the screen, uh, uh, Sky, with a, uh, oh, it says I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Can I try again? <laughs> Is it possible for me to share share some slides? Yes. Okay, let me try again. Not, not going. 
I wanted to illustrate how we look at our future, the future of science as being strongly networked. And so actually I wanted to share with you, if you could see this. Yep. Oh, great. Um, you know, this, this discussion is very consistent with where we see science going. And actually, uh, I'll illustrate that with our, our latest big scientific uh, uh, endeavor that we're starting. Uh, my team just won a large national center for quantum information science. So we, are, uh, we formed a team that is looking at taking computing from the classical era, which we've been uh, doing for many, many decades, into a new era of quantum computing. And this is a really big challenge, but it has huge economic potential. Uh, I, I firmly believe that the future of uh, information science, which has been such a driver of our economic development for so long, is now going to be in a new technology because we're reaching the limits of scaling of classical microelectronic devices. And so one of the new ideas that looks very exciting is the ability to do uh, computing with quantum mechanics, taking advantage of nature's quantum mechanical aspects. But to do that, we need a really big team and we need a diversity of folks. And that's kind of illustrated in this slide, which is why I wanted to show it. Mm -hmm. We imagine that the future of science is going to be more networked. Um, you know, for many decades, Brookhaven has built big facilities and will continue to be, build big facilities, but they're going to be more connected with the outside world than ever than ever before. And so, you know, this is, a, this is actually something we shared with the federal government. We could imagine this network where you would have national labs that are connected with universities, state partners, uh, industry, uh, and Thing, parts of this would be distributed. Parts of it would be uh, like data storage and computing would be, would be on a network. And you need to do something like this to pull together the big diverse teams that you need to address some of the complex challenges in, in uh, uh, addressing something like evolution of a quantum computing infrastructure and building a quantum computing industry in the in the United States, which I think is going to be essential for our economic growth in the um, in in this century. So, so this connectivity is dependent upon our ability to communicate. And that's why 5G is so important for us. We have to have essentially seamless, it's got to be invisible, the connectivity just has to be there. And we've, like everybody else, we've had lots of demonstrations. You know, in my house, I'm working from home, I'm able to work from home, but my two daughters are going to school in the next rooms <laughs> and, you know, we're all connected. They're doing their remote schooling and I'm doing my remote uh, work at the laboratory. That's important. But I'll give you another example that's extremely relevant. Uh, we operate at Brookhaven, the National Synchrotron Light Source. It's a big X-ray machine. But the interesting thing about that big x-ray machine, it's the best in the world, by the way, but the interesting thing about that big x-ray machine, we happen to have the best capability to understand the structure of proteins and biomolecules. Well, this is incredibly important in the fight to find a vaccine and drugs for COVID-19. And in fact, even though we've scaled back some of our efforts because of, of the COVID pandemic, we're not doing quite as much. The one thing that we've actually accelerated at Brookhaven is looking at biomolecular structure so that we could help COVID-19. So the light source, which has the best capability in the world for looking at protein structures, is working with drug companies uh, to understand how chemicals could bind to virus proteins. This helps us to develop the vaccines and drug treatments. And we're playing, we're very proud. We've done thousands of samples for the pharmaceutical industry. And, but all of that, and this is where it gets back to 5G, those folks are sending us samples. It's being mailed in and that's all being done remotely. And this is allowed because of our connectivity right now. And as, as, as was mentioned by several folks, this, this, is, this is a very important part of our, our future. And I have one more illustration I'd like to share with you. And this kind of illustrates that 
that future and what we have to do to get there. Um, this is a vision that actually is a, is a federal vision. We share this with the other light sources and free electron laser facilities uh, in the United States supported by the Office of Science. And we envision that a user, this person who's sitting in the middle, <laughs> it wants to understand some bit of science. Well, they're going to be not necessarily traveling to Brookhaven or traveling to Stanford to access some of this. They might just mail in their sample, but then they have to be able to um, run equipment remotely. They need to analyze their data. They may need to access supercomputers. And so there's a whole bunch of elements that have to be in place for this vision to become realized. We think this could really help accelerate science in the 21st century. We need things like artificial intelligence. We need better software libraries. But number five down here, notice on the, on the lower left, we absolutely need network improvements. And so that to me is where 5G is, is absolutely essential. So with that, I'll stop sharing, but- Thank um, you. Thank that's, you. Jim. That's the science basis. Okay. Thank can you. I, can, yeah. Sky, can I build on what Jim just said a little bit? So Jim took it from the science perspective and he's a scientist, clearly a very exceptional one, right? I didn't understand half of that, but it sounded really good. <laughs> but I'm just I'm, that's I'm making fun of myself. I'm kidding. It was great. Uh, but I wanted to jump in because while he was looking at from a scientific perspective, Brookhaven National Lab is one is a world class research institution that we are very fortunate to have on Long Island. There are only so many across the country. It is a huge economic um, development. It, it's huge for our e economy out here. It, we're talking multi-hundred million dollar economic impact at Brookhaven National Lab, thousands of employees. It's one of the largest employers in the, in the region, okay? They are part of our innovation economy that we're trying to build here. So anything that we can do in terms of 5G to help Jim and his folks at BNL do their job, their great job better and more efficiently and faster, that's good for our economy out here too. And will also lead to more jobs. And uh, let me just add one quick thing, Matt, thanks very much. And, uh, you know, Long Island Association has really helped us connect in a lot of different ways. But, uh, you know, Matt mentioned partners. Partners are essential. You know, the, uh, the work we're doing in uh, biology, we work with Stony Brook very closely, Cold Spring Harbor uh, a Laboratory. But also we're working with the Yale Medical School, we're working with other medical schools. Uh, the quantum effort that I just mentioned, we brought in a new $115 million center to look at quantum computing. That is a network because it involves Yale, MIT, Princeton, Columbia, Stony Brook, SUNY Poly upstate, IBM is a major partner. We have to be networked to be effective, and we are networked. Actually, every meeting we've had so far has been a virtual meeting, <laughs> um, and we're, we're mailing samples to one another, but the connectivity, the ability for scientists to work together and to translate this to business, working with IBM, it's all, it requires a network. It's, uh, it's our new way of doing science. Right. So, Carmen, we've spoken about these different ways to connect the community in different industries. What else do you tell the community when you're out there explaining 5G to folks and, and how it impacts the different industries? Yes. So to piggyback on uh, Jim and Matt's comments that, um, you know, it's so we provide Fiverr to a number of schools and governments across the country. Also, I'm um, here within uh, the state, a number of municipalities as well. And, you know, for us, the infrastructure is it's, you know, it's going along the street. It's there built on the, you know, you don't see it or it's hanging from wooden utility poles. But there are businesses and homes all along the route that then can have access to that fiber and can, can have access that same robust computing power that uh, BNL uses would be available to other businesses because the infrastructure exists. And that's part of what we are trying to, you know, espouse as part of 5G. We all want and increasingly need the services because as, you know, you get used to something, if it's gone, how, mu how many of us remember, I'm dating myself like Matt, um, that, okay, remember when you had a dial up? You couldn't even think about that now. Right. Or 
we've had so many storms this year and where I live kind of in the woods, trees go down. And then our internet, we've had loss of power and internet for a couple of days. After a couple of hours, my family are like, can we go to the library? I can, is there a hotel? Like, mom, we got to get out of here. So you get used to the things and they do become essential services. And so that is one thing that um, with 5G and bringing that forward, I think that, um, at least for me, I've had some questions. Well, what is fundamentally different um, from an infrastructure perspective? Am I going to see a lot of new fiber or a lot of new poles or a lot of new infrastructure that I may think is unesthetically pleasing? Or, you know, is there going to be a lot more construction? Those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. The answer, because we have 5G now, yeah, it, for for most of what we have, you would upgrade it. So in our case, we're adding additional fiber where it exists, or we are adding, you know, technology has gone at the speed of light. How, you know, we had those big phones and now you have something that fits into your pocket that frankly you, you might forget about and put in the wash, it's so small. So that's the same thing with equipment. So we have larger boxes, you know, on poles now. Those would come down with something that's smaller. The, and the equipment that's the same size does exponentially more. So yes, as we go into communities, as Caitlin had mentioned, that do not have service um, or as robust service, yes, we're going to be adding infrastructure. But it's the same thing as with the railroads or with electricity coming to communities. You did have to add infrastructure to get the service. Um, with Crown um, and with the United States in general, with the FCC, there are, and with states, there's lots of regulation and protection um, communities have say in how you know where thing infrastructure goes the look of it and crown as a partner with communities because we believe and know the the reality is that the equipment that we install the infrastructure we install will be there for decades mm -hmm. and we really believe that we're partners with communities so we do go through i mean i personally meet with communities do you like the powder brush gray for equipment boxes or the dark gun metal gray. I mean, we get to that detail because we know that we are partners, but there are folks who drive by the infrastructure or walk by who will have to, who will be with that for some time. And we really take that responsibility very seriously. But to Caitlin's point, you know, for the infrastructure, it does require um, for the, the reality is for us to continue to install and be at the front of 5G, and there's lots of worldwide competition. So it's something that we need, something that we want. So how do you deploy it? And it is more effective and faster for all of the revenue and growth and jobs that Matt mentioned, all of the great scientific pushes that we want and need, frankly, for our communities that Jim has mentioned. You need to have the infrastructure. We want it to be, be deployed effectively and efficiently. And so it is more helpful if we have regulations and guidelines that the industry like Crown Castle can work within that will make deployment understandable, a repeatable process so that businesses understand what they're getting into and then can quickly provide these services to all these businesses and communities. A few questions about, about what you said, Carmen. It's very sure. interesting. Um, the difference between 5G and 4G, like you mentioned with Hurricane Sandy, a lot of people lost the internet and lost connectivity. Yes. With 5G technology, will that be preventable? How is it different? So it, it is the same um, way that we are installing the infrastructure. We have, the industry has learned, um, equipment manufacturers and the industry has learned a lot about redundancy and making equipment more kind of weatherproof um, and with battery backup. So it is the, the technology it does is not better in that way. It's faster and you can do a lot more data uploads and downloads. Jim can talk about that more specifically than I can. Um, so the, the improvement is in the service. The way that we deploy it will address some of the issues that you mentioned with storms. 
Okay. And then also with all the technology and infrastructure, is 5G safe? Are these different towers, cells, and fibers, is it safe? Yes. So, and I say that unequivocally. Um, and I do believe that we also have a slide. I'm not technical. I know you shared it with me. Let me pull it up. Zoom and I are intermittent friends. So I don't know that you, there, thank you. I think we Here, can, can you see this? part of it. No, this one. I may only, it may be me though. I'm not sure that we see the whole thing. Um, but what this is trying to show is, and I think if you could go down a little, that 5G, 4G, what we have now from in, in other than test cities that some of the uh, carriers have announced, they are the same. And that I know that the issue of um, Emission. Oh, this? yeah, that's perfect. Great. Yeah. At, le at least I, that for me. But again, Zoom and I are not necessarily always friends. Wait, no, we're good. And just keep <laughs> close into your microphone, Carmen. I know you're yes. spoken. So. Gosh, and that's so hilarious because I am the loudest person. So here, let me see if that helps. Okay, Sorry. Thank you. And then this that's looks on the screen. That's perfect. Okay, great. Please. And and so this is just a little um, diagram that would you know help to explain that 4G and 5G these are safe. That you're showing a, a long going from sort of the left where the technical term and again Jim can explain this more clearly than I can. But on the left going to the right, the left is where you're having lower. Um, emissions and as you can see with phones 4g 5g it's the same and there have been countless studies hundreds of studies on this very issue and they come out by reputable scientific organizations over and over doing their own studies not just looking at the analysis of someone else someone else's work and they come to the same conclusion that it is safe and as you can see that some of these things give off more emissions that you wouldn't even realize um and and so the in short, it is safe. And it is the same emissions as what we're receiving today with 4G. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop the screen then. Okay, awesome. So I wanna talk more about jobs. We talked about, Jim mentioned the different types of jobs in science because we'd have to, with the new network and connecting people and Matt mentioned the business community. Um, what other types of jobs do you think would become available and how are people trained on this new type of network in order to attain some of these new jobs that will be available? And I, you tell me, Carmen, I guess that's a question for you. So I can speak for Crown that when we build networks, so there is the actual construction. We hire from local businesses because they know the lay of the land, they know the communities, and um, you know can help us with any sort of regulations and that sort of thing. So when we're building networks, so those are jobs there. We do hire. Um, we have offices. I think we're up to sixty or seventy offices across the country, and in big markets like New York, of course, we have multiple offices, and we have have actually multiple ones um, in Long Island. So we um, need folks to help maintain and then help us expand our networks. And so we have those long-term and their um, professional positions as well as you know construction jobs. That And we're also looking for internships. We do a Connected by Good program where we are hiring from the community and we're looking for how, you know, uh, before the pandemic, um, our uh, job, uh, what unemployment rates were the lowest that they've been in something like 20 years. And so that will come back. And so for us, we're looking for how do we find, you know, college and high school students and people who are looking to change industries and frankly come into a very um, dynamic industry. So we're always looking for that in our local communities. Um, and I'm sure that Caitlin might be able to have some other suggestions with some of our other 5G, um, New Yorkers for 5G members. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that we talk about a lot, I know that Matt mentioned overall, 5G investments are supposed to generate more than 3 million new jobs, 500 billion the GDP growth, I think it's 275 billion investments nationwide. Um, and the wireless industry in New York is really responsible for, I believe it's around 200,000 
jobs and nearly $28 billion in GDP. Um, so I just kind of take a step back for a moment, talk a little bit about small businesses. Um, bringing more high-speed wireless to New York is going to be really instrumental to helping small businesses across the state, which we know that the governor and other key policymakers have long recognized are truly the backbone of our economy. They employ over, I believe, half of the private sector workforce. So ensuring that more of these businesses have full cellular coverage and access to high-speed broadband will help level the playing field and really enable them to better compete in the global marketplace. So while that doesn't necessarily answer the um, question of which specific industries the job growth will impact, I think it's important to mention the small businesses and how instrumental 5G will be to helping to maintain and grow these. And Sky, can I build on what uh, Caitlin just said? Sure. Uh, completely agree that it's important. You know, small businesses are struggling uh, so much right now, and this would be huge for small businesses and would really help them um, as they try to recover. And I just want to shift gears because it also uh, does um, impact small businesses. But about a week or so ago, I saw another report by the New York Urban League. This is really, um, you know, it's a fairness issue too, right? Um, you know, we, we often hear the, the phrase, the digital divide. Um, you know, the, the New York Urban League did a report, uh, again, it was about a week ago, that saw, that said the pandemic, or reported that the pandemic has exacerbated the digital divide between, you know, white and black New Yorkers, right? Um, we've heard this, we've seen this, and access to speedy internet is huge. And whether it's for small businesses, whether it's in your house or your apartment, or it's for kids at school, um, you know, 5G is a way to hopefully bridge that digital divide, and we have to make sure we're doing everything to um, ensure that 5G, as it's getting rolled out, is rolled out in minority communities, just like it's in white, rolled out in white communities. And that's gonna be a way that we recover economically too. And also, if, like I said, it's a social justice issue as far as I'm concerned. And to really piggyback on to what Matt said, which I think is a really important point I wanted to bring up, um, the investment in 5G technology can really be used as a vehicle for social change. I mean, we're hearing stories, for example, one of our coalition members, Seneca Nation of Indians, they have incredibly poor connectivity. Many of them had to leave their homes and then stay in their cars and do mobile hotspots, for example, outside of large um, malls in order to be able to have their student connect and be able to talk to a professor online. That's a problem and we need to really start addressing this digital divide and mitigating the next one. So I think it's a really important point I just wanted to um, to be back on. Are there any examples of countries or counties anywhere that do have 5G already and it's working in that neighborhood or wherever it is? So um, let me get closer to my microphone. Um, that with the wire, at least for, for me and understanding the wireless industry, um, you'll see periodically um, announcements by the big carriers. Verizon, AT&T um, have been quite public in listing their top, it started their first five, then their first 10. And I think that they're, they're both up to their first or their top 25 cities with 5G. Um, and, you know, when I think it was, one of the other questions that I often get is, well, you know, do, how quickly does it, do, does it exist now? Mm -hmm. And, um, to, again, it's based upon the infrastructure. So you need to have the fiber that's capable, the equipment boxes, all of those sorts of things um, to make that um, available to the public. So there are um, major and smaller um, cities um, that have access to 5G from a wireless carrier perspective. Um, but when, as you see, um, like now is a nice time where the carriers are introducing their new phones and they are saying, they're touting that they're 5G capable. That's part of the infrastructure that you need. It's one thing to have it, um, you know, the tower or the small cell provide it or your venue where you used to go to basketball games or that sort of thing. Um, but you need a device, both the transmitting and the receiving devices have to be 5G capable so that we can start to experience this. And so equipment manufacturers, carriers are really working very hard on making sure that the equipment is available and it, they're starting to, um, it's certainly within all of their business plans and building it out. But it is, it takes the time to construct.
And that's why it's, it's so important to be able to work with the federal, state, local communities on the regulations to help us deploy this equipment as expeditiously as possible. And construction and then con constructing that means more jobs, right? It sure does. Yeah. That's right. So right now, if I go to the Apple store and I buy the new iPhone 12, I think it is, it has, it's 5G capable, but um, on Long Island, does that, what does that mean then? It means your phone is ready for 5G, <laughs> um, but you would not be able to experience that unless you went to one of the cities where it's currently deployed. Um, and and so we could look at what those cities are, but it is the carriers have done, I think a nice job in having a variety. It's not only, you know, Cal, it's not only Los Angeles, for example, it's smaller communities as well. And um, because they're trying to build demand, but to show folks that it does work in all kinds, you know, across the country. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that ties back into science. And, and Jim, I want to go back to you. You mentioned quantum mechanics and a lot of terms that Matt jokingly said he doesn't understand half of half of what you said. And, and you are brilliant scientists and a lot of people don't understand a lot of what you are explaining. So I want to ask you, how does this research that you're doing impact your average person? Well, it's uh, it's it's slightly beyond the horizon uh, right now. What we're doing is working on uh, the scientific advances that are going to enable the next generation or maybe even the generation after the next generation. And we have to be working on it now. Uh, it takes a long time for uh, the scientific advances to actually get translated into uh, impacts. Kind of a figure of merit that I once heard, and it's, it's, it's actually, I've seen it happen many times. You know, you invent something, by the time it actually gets totally commercialized, can take up to 20 years. <laughs> so we're working on things that are a bit over the horizon. And right now we're working on quantum. And what does that mean? Well, uh, it means weird, frankly. You could use <laughs> another uh, expression for quantum. The world that we live in is, is a classical world. And uh, if we were able to experience directly the quantum world, it would seem very strange to us. But this is the world when you make things very, very small, the laws of physics are actually a little bit uh, weird to us, and we wouldn't experience that in our day-to-day -day life on the scale on which we live. So, but when you get down to the size of atoms, for example, um, for example, the electrons that are circulating, circulating around a nucleus, they're only allowed to have certain energies, whereas you know, if I, if I go down to the basement and get on my treadmill, I, in principle, could run at any speed that I want to. I can, you know, change it continuously. Electrons, the energies that electrons have around atoms are actually discrete. They're only allowed certain values, and those are called quanta. And that's where quantum comes from. And so a lot of weird things happen, and it effectively is, is a result of the fact that electrons uh, actually have a wave nature. And most particles have a way of nature. When you get to very large things like people, uh, you know, all of this averages out and we're in a classical world where those quantum mechanical effects are not very apparent for the most case, for the most part. But on the microscopic, on the atomic level, that's very important. And that actually allows us to do some different types of calculations than we're doing right now. And this is what has evolved as quantum computation. And the fundamental difference right now, if you look at a digital computer, we work with ones and zeros. Uh, and in fact, you see on TV shows, they, all, they talk about digital and all these ones and zeros. Well, in quantum mechanics, if you're doing quantum computing, you have a one and a zero, but you also have what's called a phase. And so it gives you a new degree of freedom. What that allows us to do, and we can do that because we're manipulating uh, uh, quantum mechanical systems to do the calculation for us. And we're taking advantage of that wave nature of systems, which is where the phase of the wave comes in, whether you're at a peak or a valley. And so this allows us to do a more powerful computation. And it gets to the question of scaling. 
And some of the problems that we want to answer in, in science or in everyday life often don't scale particularly well on the computers that we have. Even if you made a really huge me mega high performance computer, there's still problems that we can't solve. And at Brookhaven, for example, you know, this thing behind me, you see the relativistic heavy ion collider and the electron ion collider that uh, was mentioned earlier. We're looking at the structure of the nucleus. And it's kind of cool uh, when we're, we're doing these collisions, what happens is the nucleus initially melts into uh, protons and neutrons. And then we raise the temperature even a little higher and even a proton or a neutron melts into quarks and gluons. That is called, uh, th that's the very fundamental nature of matter. We don't understand it. And to the calculations that we need to do to understand that you can't do on a classical computer. They just don't scale well. But by having that extra degree of freedom in a quantum computer, we're gonna be able to do that. It also makes a difference as we're searching for new materials. You want to make uh, uh, materials, for example, that have better you know, batteries that last longer, that are safer. Uh, those are complex materials calculations that also don't necessarily scale very well. We're going to be able to model things on computers that we can't model right now, and that's going to open up a whole new world of discovery. So, so yes, we're, we're beyond the horizon a little bit. I apologize, but we're doing the basic research to get over the horizon and get to the next generation. Right. So, so what I think you're saying, and Caitlin, help me translate it if you would, but what I think you're saying, Jim, is that all this research that you're doing will require a more high-speed network with connectivity AKA yeah. 5G in order to accomplish these things. Absolutely. And uh, uh, we see that already, even in uh, uh, what we're doing today, uh, we require more and better uh, network connections. It's gotta oh. be seamless. So what about someone who's not involved in scientific research? How will a typical phone user benefit from 5G? We know it's faster, but what's, what's another typical way that a your average person will benefit from 5G? I think that's more a question for Carmen than me. <laughs> Sorry, like so many users, I can't find my unmute button. So, uh, um, but how, well, I'll give you an example. So many, not only are we working from home now, but in the future, right, in the reading of the Times every day, they're talking about what's the going to happen to Manhattan real estate. How many people no longer need offices? Um, that my husband has his own um, small business, and this allows him to continue to have a business, but he's growing, He's in the real estate industry also, and he's looking at, you know, if there are deals, but, um, but there, you know, I do think that we, you'll always need Manhattan real estate. So I'm with Jerry Seinfeld on that. Um, but it will, you know, will, the, there are going to be some businesses where, and for some functions that people will continue to work from home but not everyone. And with, as we've seen time and time again, with technology advances, new businesses appear. And so with Matt and, you know, those, you know, those huge numbers, that's so exciting, right? Because those are, I have to think, you know, with Caitlin, those are small and medium-sized businesses that will come into being. And if we're losing so many businesses now, hopefully there, there is a light to the end of this tunnel and it's next year. And we will be able to have new businesses come into fruition. And it is this technology that will help them do that, right? With Square and, you know, you can, how many times I've been in a taxi, I know, or maybe, well, I don't know, something, a ride share where, or it's a small, um, what is it? A, a lunch cart. And they, it's a guy and his brother and his phone with that little square thing. And he takes my order. Mm -hmm. So you'll have more of those and it will allow for medium sized businesses to grow into large ones. So the, the, again, I'm not sure. I love that question because what I think is so exciting about it is that we don't know all of it. Because again, the technologies will allow new industries to come into being, just like with Uber and Lyft, right? Who would have thought of that even five years ago? 
Right. It's revolutionary. And the time, it becomes shorter and shorter where you see new businesses come into being. Now, Carmen, you mentioned next year. Is that, what is next year? Is that when we can expect 5G on Long Island? Well, we'll 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 have to talk to the to our customers, our wireless carriers, about that. But I'll tell you that for the networks that we have installed in Long Island and in and all over the country, the carriers are coming to us with new uh, and and they're building their own. But they are um, coming out with new places for new networks. They want to expand the networks that they have. They are coming to us with, I have networks that are installed with 4G or even 3G equipment. We want to replace and upgrade with 5G equipment so that they are ready. So absolutely. And the carriers are very bullish on this. They are, that's part, that's, that's their build plan from now. We have some carriers who are doing that now in jurisdiction, in, in municipalities and definitely into next year and beyond. And we'll be doing this for some time. You mentioned implementing 5G. And I do, I, I just want everyone to know that I've been incorporating some of the audience questions throughout the conversation this entire time. But because we have 10 minutes left, I'm going to turn my attention more to some of the questions that we haven't addressed. Um, about 5G, we need the 5G network and you mentioned the 5G devices. So what does that mean for someone who has a non 5G cell phone? How will their phone, will that continue to work? Yes, it will, um, because it is going to take some time for every part of the United States to have, you know, 5G equipment installed. So just as we have now with our wireless devices, there are some um, slower adopters, let's say, like my father who may be watching this. So don't take offense, dad. Um, but until recently he had a flip phone. And so we actually call him grandpa flip phone, but he um, had that and he loved it. But he finally got a smartphone and finds the capabilities. But that is, I mean, he, that was like a 2G technology and the carriers continue to deploy those. They have spectrum, you know, the technology to use those, but gradually those technologies, the two, the three G will come down and the four and the five G will go up. And so it will, you'll have plenty of notice from your carrier that frankly, your device won't work. So really for people who have devices now, they will continue to work and you'll have plenty of notice when we do fully go to 5G. But if you have a 4G, even a 3G um, equipment, you know, and that's more than your phone, but it could be your router at home. It could be, you know, things like that. You'll get plenty of notice and they will work for some time. You'll know when you need to upgrade. And Another, yes, Caitlin, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I was just going to say um, to pivot a little bit. So 5G, I mean, it's all about increasing our capabilities, strengthening our tools. And I know one industry that we have not really spoken about while we've paid a lot of attention to education, which is important in telehealth, we haven't really talked about how 5G can actually strengthen public safety tools for first responders. And I think that's a really important um, topic. 80% of 911 calls, surprisingly, are placed from a wireless device. And this makes cellular service more important than ever before. So 5G will really deliver better digital access to emergency services provided by police officers, firefighters, first responders, who have you. Um, and I guess to get a little bit more specific, the faster systems that 5G can actually provide, it can enable these first responders to access their enhanced location data for 911 calls. They can send video or pictures to their command centers in real time, which is incredibly important. So I just wanted to, um, while it's pivoting a bit, as I mentioned, I think it's an important topic to mention because it does impact so many important industries like um, first responders and public safety. Right. Thank you, Caitlin. And I will reiterate that this is a two-part series on the power of 5G. So next Thursday, we'll dive even deeper into how 5G impacts education and healthcare as two specific industries. We'll, we'll have a full hour on that next Thursday at 10 a.m. Another question, I know Caitlin and Matt, you mentioned the digital divide. Another question is, how will 5G fix the digital divide? Isn't it about infrastructure? And if you need to purchase a new phone for 5G, doesn't that create 
more of a divide. I would just say that we've seen with the pandemic, and I'll let Caitlin sort of fill in some of the technical and the infrastructure uh, related part of the question, but as we've seen with the pandemic, and I mentioned it before, um, you know, this, it's exacerbating the digital divide. So we have to be cognizant you know, there are kids in the city, there are kids out here that aren't able to connect remotely when they ha when remote learning is what's happening these days, where they can't go to a doctor's office and they have to do telehealth, but they can't do it out of their apartment or their house. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the reality of the world is more affluent communities are able to do this uh, and less affluent community communities have some issues with this. And 5G is, is hopefully a way, as long as the folks that are doing the 5G and putting the infrastructure in place are making it a priority to make sure that underserved communities are getting it as equal access as more affluent communities. I think it's gonna be revolutionary. I hope it'll be revolutionary for um, minority communities out here in the city and elsewhere to be able to have better access, better availability, quicker access. They don't have to go, I think uh, Car mentioned before there, or maybe Caitlin, they don't have to go to a hotspot Oh, it was, it was uh, Caitlin, they don't have to go to a hot spot off the side of the road to be able to talk to their teacher or to get a doctor's appointment through telehealth. This is game changing type stuff. And um, I'm sure that, you know, folks from Crown, New Yorkers for 5G, making sure that uh, fairness and the social justice, justice aspect of it, equal access is right there on top of their priorities and how it's gonna be implemented. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and what Matt said is completely correct, unfortunately, so much of the world is waking up to reality that minority communities and then those in rural areas too have long understood. And it's the fact that unfortunately the digital divide, it's not colorblind um, for lack of better words. So as policymakers and elected officials are starting to double down in their efforts to address the digital divide, and that's really important, but if just focusing on today's technology crisis is gonna be setting up the same underserved communities to fail in the future. So we really need to take those steps now to ensure that they're not left behind in the next wave um, as the country moves to next generation connectivity. So now is the time to make sure that it's truly statewide and equitable across the board. And you mentioned a technology crisis, Caitlin. We're in the middle of that. We're in the middle of a health crisis, a pandemic. And, and one of the questions is about people who have lost their jobs over the last nine months will they be able to be trained on a way to get a new job by the advances that you're speaking about when it comes to 5G with all the different jobs becoming available? Will these types of workers be able to be trained to have those types of jobs? Is that a Carmen question or a Caitlin question? I don't know who would be best equipped to answer that type of a question. So I could take a, a stab at it that yes, um, that as I mentioned that Crown, that we are really looking to make sure that we have a bench of folks, a pipeline of high school graduates or kids in high school. We do, like I said, Connected by Good, where we do a number of programs a year all over the country where we have offices. So we are actively looking for recruits, to be frank, um, from young um, kids, then um, in college, and then, you know, as we have positions and, again, people who want to have a, a, a a career change potentially. So yes, we are always looking for good candidates. Um, and we do have a number of internship programs um, across the country in, in, that, in a few cities. And then we're look, we are continuing to grow those. Carmen, what about non-young kids? Are there opportunities for people? Like you, I know you mentioned career change, but are there opportunities for people who maybe didn't work historically in technology? Well, the, yes, I mean that we are an equal opportunity employer. And to be honest, for me, as someone who makes hiring decisions, I'm looking for, you know, folks who have innate uh, skills, you know, are you detail oriented and, you know, could are go getter and those sorts of things that I find that, you know, especially with the technology industry, those are things um, that you could learn, right? We could teach you that it is where you have the want to, you know, be involved in a dynamic industry and um, have the right attitude is what I think we're looking for. And I know that we're rounding out our hour here. Um, another question, will 5G make asynchronous chatting more synchronous 
just as people who are on a Zoom call who are trying to sing or play music together. So yes, I mean, that's part of it with 5G is that with that platform, you can transmit and receive a vast no amount of data extremely quickly and it doesn't um, delay. So yes, it'll be like you really are in the next room with someone. Okay, and I, the final question here, because we just talked about the different types of jobs, what industries, businesses, and skills will be required to deploy the infrastructure that will carry 5G? So from a construction perspective, or I mean, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, I'll say, we are looking for people, you know, with tech uh, construction backgrounds, um, fiber, wireless industry helps, of course, um, but also project management and RF engineers. We have lots of um, GIS folks, um, but I mean, to be frank, Crown is a big company like lots of companies. So we need accountants and lawyers and you know people on my team who will meet with communities and negotiate agreements. So really for anything, we have positions as do the other wireless carriers as well. So thank you. That's all the time that we have for today. And I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but that's why we have next Thursday, December 10th at 10 a.m. So everyone that's listening today can sign up for that panel as well. And we'll continue this important and valuable conversation about 5G. And again, today's session was recorded. So if you'd like to see the recording of today's webinar, you can visit our website, liherald.com slash inside li. And the recording from today will be posted there. And if anyone has any comments or questions, you can email me at insideli at liherald.com. And I want to thank our sponsors for today, New Yorkers for 5G and Crown Castle. And it's an exciting future that we have. And we're all in it together as the world continues to change on a minute by minute basis. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.